Hello, everybody. This is Travis Brandt with Raven Arc Boats. I want to introduce you to the new company, Raven Arc Boats at ravenarc.com. And in particular, the Raven Arc Bootlegger 25. Let's go. Okay, the first thing, why the name Bootlegger and why the name Raven Arc? Well, the name Raven Arc came from Raven the Bird, which is an considered to be the most intelligent primate and the ark which is noah's ark and the legend goes that at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights after the great flood noah released a raven from the ark and the raven flew about to and fro and it did not come back to the ark and that is indicative of the raven as we know them today in every culture across the planet they're legendary birds particularly in the pacific northwest where we are now the raven is a coastal bird and it spends as much time over water as it does over land and they are known for intelligence and their ability to survive in extreme ruggedness so i thought it was a fitting name for the boat company so now why the bootlegger the bootlegger is named after bootlegger cove in ketchumac bay up by homer because my heart is in Kodiak and Homer, Alaska most of the time. And I believe that that market in particular uh, is, is uh, akin to my passion for having a boat that can withstand almost anything. Okay, so why the boat, right? So we've talked about the Raven Arc, we talked about the bootlegger, and now let's talk about the boat in and of itself. Uh, back in 2002, I took a job as the production manager for a company called Almar Boats. And I had come out of the Coast Guard. By this point, I was a rescue scuba diver. I was a quartermaster of the watch on a 110 foot drug patrol boat shown here. And I was uh, two years in the Caribbean, three years in Kodiak Island. One night, in the middle of the night, we left Guantanamo Bay on our way to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and the crew was sleeping. We left at midnight. We drew straws. I drew the short straw, but uh, once we secured the nav detail, then I became the CUMO, which stands for Quartermaster of the Watch, which means I was responsible to navigate the boat. Uh, that means laying down the dead reckoning course and then taking fixes periodically to make sure that we're still on course and speed and that we're going to make our time target to where we were going. In this particular case we were going to Port-au-Prince Haiti we had a meeting at a dock uh, eight o'clock in the morning we had a short window to get there we couldn't pay much attention to the weather it was really snotty and we were taking green water at the bridge windows and the ride was pretty uncomfortable we were I was hanging on uh, the captain happened to be the OOD which stands for officer of the deck so he was over manning the radar which was typically what he would do he's looking for targets and I'm driving the boat. And uh, by me driving the boat, I mean the autopilot is driving the boat and I'm giving the autopilot inputs into whether we should be turning left or turning right. And my job is just to keep us on this, the closest, straightest path so we can meet our time target. And uh, in conversation, I looked over at my captain and I said, how much did the Coast Guard pay for this boat? And he knew right away, he said, oh, it was $11 million. And I said, well, one day I'm gonna go build a better one for three. And it was in that moment when I knew that my future was probably going to somehow wind up to be a boat builder. And years later, I remember sitting on the dock in Kodiak. There's a little coffee shop there just to the north of the downtown marina. And I was looking out at the fishing vessel Saga and I was walking up and down the docks and I didn't see anything that made my heart jump or skip a beat about being the right boat for the waters. Now, obviously displacement and fishing boats, and I'm not naive enough to think that there's a lot about commercial fishing that I don't understand, but as a, as a uh, person who grew up riding motorcycles and flying small airplanes, I liked performance. And when I looked at all the small boats out there that were owned by the individuals and the families and the small organizations in town, I absolutely knew that there was a better boat out there, something that could be made from aluminum and have a hull shape, something like a Boston Whaler or a Grady White. And uh, obviously those two have 
fairly different hall shapes if you really get down to it. The Grady White is known for a ride that's got a really deep V and the Boston Whaler is known for being unsinkable because they fill the whole thing with foam. And, and there's other good civilian boats out there, but in particular in Kodiak and in the Gulf of Mexico, I did not see anything that I thought looked like the right boat. So I wanted to build it and uh, I set out to do that. Surprisingly, I, you know, comparing the airplanes to the boats, the aluminum airplane was far more advanced than an aluminum boat. And that had to do with design software and the attention of the engineering industry. So driven by like uh, companies like Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Raytheon and all these companies who were building airplanes, they had plenty of government money and they were putting a ton of design and engineering into the wing efficiency. And so the wing efficiency is, is similar to the hydrodynamic efficiency of a boat going through the water and air being a liquid, liquid water being a liquid. You know, there's similar properties there, aerodynamics versus hydrodynamics. And so it seemed to me, obviously, that nobody was putting much thought into the 30 foot and under planing surfaces to make boats efficient and ride well and to transition from being sitting in the water in their pure displacement mode while you're fishing to scooting across the water at 30, 40, 50 knots into comfortable seas. And it came down to not being able to bend the aluminum in such a way that could be consistent. And we figured out how to do that. So when I say we, I shopped IMO and I found a guy named Jarek Kanyos who is a Polish guy living in Canada. And he was messing around with some software uh, that I think was just being developed at the time. And they were able to apply properties to fairly thick pieces of aluminum, call it quarter inch, 5086, H116, has mechanical properties, shear strength, what happens when you bend it, what happens when you weld it, and can you bend it and will it naturally lay and maintain its properties. And it turns out it can, we got, he got really good at this. So back of a napkin, we had multiple meetings at usually a restaurant uh, somewhere. We started meeting in Vancouver, uh, Washington, sometimes up by the Canadian border. Sometimes I'd go across the border. A couple of times uh, he came down to either Washington or Portland. And uh, ultimately wound up with a plan for a boat and a way to build the boat out of aluminum that just seemed like it was gonna be a complete game changer. And it was, we put the first multiple boats in the water and it was absolutely fantastic. He continued the design uh, thinking, and this was as a naval architect, and I, you know, he's a, an aluminum boat designer, architectural thinking that goes into uh, the design of the boat. I found him to be, I found him to understand the concepts at play and to be able to work with things far above he simplified it to where we could put the boat together in the shop in such a way that we were consistent uh, from boat to boat and that the performance was really there. And um, we built 25 foot boats and 30 foot boats and more diesels. Absolutely phenomenal performance in the water. The next thing is how you build one. So traditionally you'd build a boat upside down like this. getting each intersection was going to take it'd be time consuming the intersections between the frames and the girders so he designed a steel female jig which allows us to lay the bottom plates in place the only downside to this obviously is you get steel tooling marks on your aluminum and they're not pretty as you get better and better at it you can make those minimized quite a bit. Um, after a while, they, they get really superficial where you can buff them out with a blue scotch bright pad fairly easily. And it gives you a lot of control 
over how hard you, how deep you weld on the quarter inch, the bottom, so you can get real deep structural welds on there. And there's a lot of, there's, there's varying techniques. I'd say that there's probably two or three common techniques in aluminum boat welding where you have structural thinking and then you just have dainty cosmetic thinking. Um, I would say my personal opinion on the design you could fairly lightly weld these things together and they're going to stay together. Uh, the design speaks for itself. Uh, Yerick's done a really good job of managing energy as it goes through the hull. And uh, if you buy a boat for me, it's going to be welded a lot more than that. But I, I like the more extreme speed. I like getting offshore 100 miles and being able to come home fairly fast and jump over a lot of waves. That's fun uh, for me. And the mission is really to leave the dock in the morning to get out as far as you can, have a good day fishing or exploring whatever you want to do, and then get back. Uh, there are a lot of people that I've built those for over the years who tell me that they go out for weeks at a time, they camp, there's a very big cuddy on board. Sometimes we put in sinks and fridges and uh, good electrical systems that handle uh, both shore power on a generator and um, heaters and uh lighting led lights accent lights in the cabin accent lights up in the cuddy led lights around obviously radars and gps chart plotters and all that but at the end of the day the mission for a boat like this is for you to control the days that you want to go on the water as opposed to the weather dictating which days that you can go out and the feedback on these boats from everybody, I've, I've never heard anything bad about them uh, in general, is that these boats can do that. And uh, by these boats, I mean the designs by Yerrick in this size. I mean, obviously I, I haven't built the largest boats that he's designed and I haven't built the smallest boats that he's designed, but I do have quite a bit of experience on the 22 to 24 to 25 foot and even 30 foot boats. And, um, can, feedback is very consistent that they're high quality in terms of their construction but ultimately that they're fantastic in really deep water so i appreciate that and having a ton of fun doing it and so let's get into the bootlegger in terms of this current boat uh, this is the first haul of the bootlegger 25 it's um 20 the way we measure that is from the front of the v to the mounting plate in this case it's a half inch mounting plate and this is 24 feet six and a half inches the engine in the up position it'd actually be about 27 so in boats uh the three feet is is a lot because you could have a 28 foot or something in there that would get you well over the 30 feet but this boat will fit perfectly into a 33 or 30 foot slip uh, it'll fit a lot of marinas. It'll go into a 26 foot slip. Uh, depends on how much they let you have overage on your outboards. And that does not include a half inch anchor sprit. We're going to put on here to hold the anchor in place. This boat's also going to get a Lumar capstan with the Okay, let's talk about headroom. This boat, in all the boats that I build, I'm six foot tall. I like to be able to walk from the deck, through the door, not have to duck, stand upright inside the cabin, walk all the way up, and then move sideways and get in front of the wheel. I like a bolstering seat, which this boat comes with. And I like to stand up, lean against the bolstering seat, have plenty of headroom, and have my head on a swivel and 360 degree visibility all the way around the boat and uh, not have to duck down and look out to the side and not have to feel like I've got to hang on or something in that position. So this boat has that and here's a picture of it. All right, the next thing is going to be this deck. The beautiful part about this boat is a single piece floor 
from the cutty bulkhead all the way back to the half inch mounting plate that the engines go on. So when we make the boat, we first one of the first things we do is we put the cutty bulkhead in. We put the frames and girders are all in, and that's a flat level surface. We take the long, it's half the boat, the whole floor, and the whole floor is sloped down. It's about an inch and a half uh, from the front to the back in terms of elevation. Uh, the gas tanks are in their level underneath it. So the floor above the gas tank is sloped down a bit. And that's because you get it flooded, water, everything scupper goes overboard. It's all welded 100% all the way around. And um, we put the, the aft cabin bulkhead, if the boat is getting one, we put that on top of the sole, the floor. So the sole is where you put your feet. Just think at the bottom of the feet, the soles goes on there. At the back of the boat, scupper that goes overboard behind the transom on the outside with these vertical little float balls in there. So um, they float right up and they go into a socket and they work really well by themselves. All right, so let's talk about the... This boat is equipped with 40 gallon fish boxes, two of them, one on each side. And each fish box is fully welded in place. It's got to drain out into a macerator pump. The macerator pump goes into a ball valve. The ball valve drives it straight overboard. So left and right, 40 gallons, that's 80 gallons. Then there's a center tank in the back, that's 25 gallons. So you have 105 gallons just of regular fish storage space. Now on this particular boat, up in the transom, we have a nine gallon live well. This and next to it is a 15 gallon compartment with two drains out. And you can either fill that with ice if you want to just go out for the day and use that as your fish box, or you can fill it with water if you want to have another live well, or you can store a generator in there if you want dry storage, or you can put other uh, storage so it's a flexible storage compartment this boat's getting 240 horse suzuki outboards 25 inch shafts with the color white they were ordered special white and because there's two uh, the boat's normally designed for a single 30 inch shaft but because we're going to be off the center line we can be at 25 inches no problem so we're going to put two 25 inch 140 horse suzuki's on here and we believe it'll be absolutely perfectly powered. This boat is also getting outriggers, which are gonna come off of the roof. They're custom made and uh, either a 12 foot or a 15 foot outrigger length on those. And the windows are gonna be side sliders. The aft door is gonna be a side slider. And for now, uh, this video is getting on about 20 minutes, so I'm going to call this version one. Now, the other day we did take this boat out of the jig, so I will show you what it looks like. Here's a couple of pictures of that in a short video. So thanks for watching. I appreciate it. If you'd like to subscribe to the channel, that would be awesome. I'm going to keep you video updated as often as I can. My phone number is on the website. That's ravenark.com. I look forward to sharing more with you as we move forward. Cheers.